Welcome to the Cabrera Lab Podcast. Drum roll. Are you ready? Yep. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> you laughing. look like you're crying. Because you cracked me up. Yeah, you're pretty funny. You are pretty funny. I am notably not funny, according yes, to my family. Are. Come on. Okay. No I have... negative self talk. True. No negative mm -hmm. self talk. Interesting that you just said that. I'm because... kidding. No, should... it's interesting you just yeah. said that because of what I was thinking about talking about today. Oh, for real? Yes. Oh, my God. We didn't plan that. Synchronicity. It's like, whoosh, oh, my God. We're in sync. Okay. <laughs> this is the worst beginning. You know what? Ever. I bet it'll be one of the most popular beginnings <laughs> because we look at these people cracking themselves up, yeah. having fun yep. in their daily life. What's the topic? I had this weird thought. We often use the words <clears throat> the norm. Duh. The norm. Now listen, I was talking to one of our children Duh. who shall remain nameless. Duh. They'll be remain nameless, who didn't do very well on a test. And this child said to us, Well, but I did better than the norm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is like pouring gas on a fire. Right. For us. And so I was thinking about this. Like, why is it that as humans, we are so in love with the idea of comparing ourselves to the norm? Why do we have the norm, first of all? I mean, I know why we have the norm, but we have the norm. And then we can, we, make ourselves feel better by comparing ourselves to the norm. And we actually use the norm as an excuse to do poorly sometimes in this case. Yeah. I mean, talk about that. That's crazy. Well, the, the reason is because we're social animals. Well, yeah. We're kind of lemmings. <laughs> we like to, we like to, we succeed in packs. Right. So what you're saying is there's good parts to the norm and there's not as good parts. Well, I mean, no, norm just means, like, normal. Normative. Normative. Which, when you say it that way, it doesn't sound that great. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be normal. Right. I, I, don't, I don't think I have you... a real risk of being, <laughs> being normal. No. But, yeah, like, who wants to be normal? But I also think... But maybe some, maybe some people want it. Well, so what you're saying is there's comfort in being part of the norm because there's that, that comfort. Yeah, I mean, if I'm being honest, like there's weird parts of my neurodiverse brain that every once in a while I kind of long to be like just normal. Yeah, but if you're normal, it, it's but, not that great. It, yeah, it's not great. I mean, I'm sort of normal. And, no, you're not. In some ways I am. But here's the thing yeah. that I have a problem with. Yeah. I think that often we weaponize the concept of the norm against children. Yeah. Where we say Johnny's 2.2 .2 points behind the norm and Johnny's literally four years old. Yeah. And it's too soon to worry about Johnny. Oh, that's incredible. And the that's norm, crazy. Right? So that bugs me. When we say that Johnny's below the norm? Yeah. We, like, we use the norm against people who are probably for one reason or the other, reasonably below the norm, but absolutely over time gonna exceed the norm, right? right. Like we don't we don't match up our expectations with the reality. <clears throat> that happened to one of our kids in reading. I know. Do you remember that? That was a very sad um, occurrence. Yeah, that was bonkers. Yes. I don't have as much problem of comparing to the norm as I do overestimating how much of a, uh, I sometimes call it machete scalpel, mm -hmm. you know? Like a machete is a pr pretty relatively not sharp blade for cutting like very rough, you know, forested jungle kind of thing. Yeah. A scalpel is a very precise instrument. And when people say things like, you're a three-year-old, like they said to us, you know, you're a three-year-old is, uh, is two and a half months behind in reading. Mm -hmm. And you're like, that's a scalpel level statement that there is no scalpel level evidence for. Right. You, you, you teachers 
you administrators have do not have the evidence to make that statement. No scientist has the evidence to make that statement. Right. So we're using this like very scalpel level thing to say your 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 son has fallen two and a half months <laughs> at three years old or however old he was. It was huh? actually five. Five, yeah, whatever. <laughs> It's fine. I mean, you know, it's just a it's a scalpel level statement. Yeah. In the context of machete level data. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the and the research on that is is pretty clear mm -hmm. that boys will lag behind girls, for example, in reading. That that schools tend to um tend to uh, pathologize pathologize boys in reading. They do. They also tend to pick uh, books that are very fictional narrative, which boys at a young age don't like. They like more graphic novels Levels and like you know, and things that be, you know, diff different things. Boy topics. Boy topics. Yes. So if you get a boy Captain Underpants, the whole set, you know, read. they'll read. They'll read Captain Underpants because they love that stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and, and the data shows that boys, boys and girls eventually. They even up. Even up. Over time. Over time around 12. I think, yeah, 12. Old. And actually, I think some of the research that we did, cause that's how we are. When somebody says something, we research it and verify yeah. it. Um, said that by the time they're 18, there's actually no discernible no difference. No discernible at difference. All. And okay. sometimes boys exceed the girls. Yeah. Um, in reading skills. So. Well, it's just they said they said they wanted to do an assessment. Remember, like I think a lot of parents are yeah. dealing with this kind of stuff. They said they wanted to do an assessment yeah. on our kid, and I said I'll let you do an assessment on our kid if we can do a parallel assessment on the school. <laughs> they didn't like that. That was very popular. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like that. Right, because let's do a parallel assessment of the school's methods. Of engagement, of engagement, of engagement, of reading, of, of pedagogy, you know, pedagogy all of, of all of it. If, if, you know, yeah. then 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 we can really compare, you know, yeah. in context what's going on. Well, I think what you were saying about the scalpel versus machete thing. I mean, the fact that, and I think this happens a lot, um, where people try to pigeonhole you into this idea, this very narrow idea, of what the norm is, yeah, to make for their own agenda or to make their own purposes, right. To, to make you seem much, much worse off or much more uh, far away from the norm yeah. as, as a tactic almost, right? Yeah. And I think we do it all the time in everyday conversation. For sure. With the words normal, normative, norm, all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's super perspectival, right? Because the norm is on a graph. Mm -hmm. And the graph is the, the the x and y coordinates of the graph have already been decided. So it's it's and it's from that perspective of whatever x and y represent mm -hmm. that the graph is normalizing. Right. So if you know if you don't buy into that perspective, then who cares? Like a great example is intelligence. Like if if you think that what you get on an IQ test is is what matters in life. Well then, I guess that graph and that normal that normal yeah indicator is meaningful. But if if you don't think that that's really what is meaningful in terms of life success and things like that, which I think there's reason to believe that it's not, um, then who cares? It's it's a norm that nobody cares about. Well, yeah, and I I also think without knowing it, people aren't realizing, especially for children when you when you constantly are saying they're you know above you know above the norm in height or weight or they're above the norm in reading skills or whatever it is in a strange way early in your life you're teaching them to get their identity in comparison to others yeah i think that's true rather than just in understanding <laughs> their own unique strengths weaknesses you know pros and grows right. and and understanding that that's part of life yep. is you know and then this, like being a superstar, most of the superstars I've talked to, they compare themselves to themselves. They compare their effort today to their previous yeah. efforts. And so they're looking for norms With around themselves. their own data, yeah. not norms in relation to others. 
That's right. Because we're kind of unique fingerprints, you know? Yeah. I know that sounds kind of... Kind of what? Kind of foofy, but... Uh, <laughs> foofy. <laughs> you know, we're kind of unique fingerprints. Like, we bring together a lot of weird stuff to yeah. create that which is us. Yeah. And so you can't plot that on a normative X, Y graph. You can't plot the complexity of what makes it a human, right? Uh, you know, on on a two dimensional or even a three dimensional graph and establish n n normativity. Yeah. yeah. You know, who knows what's gonna in evolution? There are these niches, and organisms occupy these niches. Meaning they have their own specialized identity and function in in the larger ecosystem. They're able like, to adapt to some unique yeah. little place in the world, mm -hmm. you know, and and that nobody else can adapt to, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and and then they find their little home, right? Mm -hmm. And we should do that too. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, the other thing I I keep thinking about is. Um, it's so ingrained in everything we do, this idea of the norm and being above or below it. I mean, you think about what what happens to a person or a you know, a person along their trajectory if they're constantly told they're above the norm, above the norm, above yeah. the norm, above the or norm. Or below the norm. Well, I'm saying it, if you're it's in the tails. both ends. Yeah. Like, you know, that that will completely shape that person's self perception. Mm. You, you you can end up with hubris, you can end up with no confidence. I've noticed this in bars. Like drinking bars? Like yeah. Bars? Like whenever you play pool in a bar, mm -hmm. you always play just a little bit better than the people you're playing against. I have not had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> Which bugs me because I always think like, so if the person was better, I would play better. So why don't I play as good as I can play? When you're alone? Yeah. No, like I'm saying, like if if the people are terrible, yeah, at the you know when they're putting quarters in the pool table, yeah, I'm not a pool shark or anything, but I'm okay, yeah, and like I'm talking bar pool, not like you know billiards, like just playing pool in the bar, okay. Right? If the people are terrible, then you'll play just enough to beat them. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Meaning, yeah, you're setting your skill level based on based theirs. on theirs instead of just being as good instead as of you just are. being as good as you can be. Interesting. It's really in, an interesting phenomena. I think that translates across everything. Yeah. Right. So, so say you know, for example, we have high achieving kids in yeah. some ways yeah. with grades and things. For sure. Well, okay. So, if I have to put in seventy percent of the effort and I still get an A. Totally. I, mean, I hear I, kids I, talking I'm about not that all the time. I put in hundred percent because I just why did do a, I need to? A, court, a ton of kids were saying that. Saying that. They say, "Oh, I get straight A's. I don't even work hard." Right. So and you're like, imagine learning. what they could do if they weren't comparing to the norm. Right. Right. Like that's what I'm saying. I know you are. I'm agreeing with that. It's a problem. It is. Because we're not reaching our full potential, and we're not challenging ourselves just to challenge ourselves. A hundred percent. Just for our own sake. Like imagine, imagine if everybody just sort of said, "What am I capable of?" Mm -hmm. Rather than, "Can I get an A?" Yeah. Because getting an A, and not that getting, I got all straight F's. So uh, in <laughs> high school, so for you. <laughs> getting an A was like impossible. <laughs> Yeah, you mean in the in the scope of life, it really is fairly meaningless in some ways. It's also meaningful in terms of your opportunities. It can be meaningful in terms of the doors that it yeah. opens, which is a sad part of of that kind of thing. Because if you if you're if you're not understanding that it's going to open those doors, mm -hmm. I sometimes talk about um, you know people talk about opening doors, and you think so. It's like about there's this door. Mm -hmm. And does the door open or will the door open? But I think life's way more tricky than that. I think it's a hallway and it just is walls. Hmm. And there are secret doors oh. that don't look like doors. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And they only open for certain people. Really? Based on how hard you work and how uh, and, and how much effort you put in and... 
and also probably who you know and what the, all those kinds of things. But w this notion that the, will the doors open, you know, it pre-assumes that you know that there's a door there. Right. And what I see happening all the time is, especially young people, they'll look around for the door, the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then if there's an opportunity, they might perform. But what they don't understand is there's opportunities everywhere mm -hmm. and they don't always know that they're in in that moment standing in an opportunity right right so it's more like a secret door that looks yeah. like a wall yeah right hmm. and then all of a sudden the wall opens because of your hard work yeah yeah and your hard work is how you get to see it yeah is usually right? hard work yeah I think or passion or curiosity or just integrity or, you know, yeah. any of these sort of like Indeed. things that as a as an older person, as an older adult now, today I go in the world and I'm like, I really notice it when somebody has integrity. Yes. You know, that I notice beyond. it. Yeah. Somebody that goes an extra measure mm -hmm. when they don't have to. I notice it because so few people do. Mm -hmm. So I notice it. I go, wow, that that person is like. They're doing a good job just because they enjoy being good at something. Yeah. yeah. Right? They're they're not they're not looking for the the door and then and then playing to the to the opportunity. Right. And in a weird sort of way, I think that's where opportunities come from. They come they come when you don't know that they're there. That's true. You miss them a lot. You miss you them miss a lot. miss opportunities a lot. So you should always just kind of like Think of everything. Be your best self yep. as much as possible. Have integrity, you know. Yeah, I mean, but the other, the sort of, um, how would I put it? I don't want to say dark side. The other side of the norm is the fact that the norm has been established by people who are normative. Yeah. Right? Which means that people who are non-normative or neurodivergent or in any way different. Yeah are being judged against a criteria that is not fair. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Meaning I, you know, I'm neuro, I'm a neurotypical person. Yeah. No, pretty solid. Pre pretty solidly neurotypical. Yeah. And there were doors. There were for me. Yeah. There was no hidden doors. There wasn't a hallway without doors. Oh, really? There were doors. And those doors were put in place by the other people in front of me that were the same. Oh. Right? That's 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 true. So you have like door goggles. <laughs> I don't know. That, that nobody means. gave me a set of door goggles. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, like you have an extra sensory yeah. door. You're like, door, door. I see the doors. I don't see the doors. Because the doors were designed by people who are also like me. Whoa. <laughs> that I'm just serious. blew my mind. Did it really? Mm. Yeah. Okay. You don't want to be that like cynical. I don't want to be that cynical that, that that it's that that it's that sort of like right, but it's just like what you've been saying, like we say all the time about a fish being asked to climb a tree. Yeah. Right? Well, the normative people set up the trees. The yeah, normative bingo. people are monkeys. Yeah. Right. And so we made trees. You made trees because we can climb them. Yeah. And so what I'm what I'm trying to get at is when you think about. I always want that to be different. Like you guys should be fish. Or there could be a pond and a tree. Monkeys. Why don't we have a tree and a pond? I agree. Like, but can we be the monkeys? I don't care. Monkeys are just more fun. Oh, they are. Yeah. And fish. <laughs> yeah, fish you got more. <laughs> well, let's think of a different thing. What could you ask to climb a tree other than a fish that couldn't climb it, but that's cooler than a fish? Well, everything's cooler than a fish. Okay, but what's cooler than a fish <laughs> that's not able to climb a tree? Lots of things can climb trees. Yeah, a lot of things. Even a slime mold could technically climb a tree. So yeah. like, uh, maybe fish is the only option. Yeah, it's kind of you're stuck. You're a fish. Yeah. But it, but the point is that this this whole idea. So the norm is a useful construct. Yeah. Mathematically and statistically and you know societally and medically. Yeah. Right. It has it has value. The idea yeah. of a norm in in certain contexts. Yeah. But it's also abused in other contexts yeah. in, in many ways, like the, our experience with our son and the reading thing. I mean, that was ridiculous. That was traumatic for him to yep. feel inadequate for no reason. Completely. Yeah. Don't even get me started on crackheads. But 
I didn't appreciate what that did to him. Yeah. Um, he's fine now. Uh, he's a great reader. He's a book he's way a above us. He's like a stellar he's like reader. Straight A student. Yeah. yeah. Okay, anyway, what I was saying is, it's weird because you take an idea like the norm, <clears throat> and just like we say all the time, you have to see all sides of it, right? So the norm has a functional value mathematically, societally, medically, because it helps us make decisions. Mm -hmm. But it also has this other side to it, which is it can be weaponized in an individual context or in a social context. Yeah. Um, and also, it it has set the playing field in a certain way. Yeah. And there are people on that field now who, you know, struggle to get on it. Totally. It's not good. I had a friend, a really smart friend, tell me once I was we were selling a house. Mm -hmm. And it was not a great market to sell a house. It was a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. And I was complaining like, you know, I don't know, it's kind of a, you know, buyer's market and it's going to be hard to sell a house now and blah, blah, blah. And he said, and he's pretty good at stats and things like that. So he said, the thing is, you only have to sell one house. <laughs> yeah. Right. So the so the the aggregate statistics are kind of irrelevant. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> like statistics works that way, right? Because you can have a house that's way over in the tail. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's so like if, if right. all you have to do is sell that one house, then just sell that. At, at the, focus your effort. And focus your effort on that because you do, you don't have to normalize the one house. Right. That's just one data point. Right, but then take that to people. That's uh, the, that was the yeah. That was the that point. was the point. Oh, you were explaining it, and I missed the point. I was explaining what? No, you were making that point. You were connecting it I'm to saying, people. I'm saying, I'm saying, yeah, like Which if, so if we base our individual performance on, on the, the norm. norm, on the aggregate statistical norm, mm -hmm. as it, as if as if our, our individual performance can't exist well beyond or well below the norm, right? Mm -hmm. That's a problem. It's a, it's a, it's it's kind of a. Um, macro micro right shift in the view yeah that changes so, the thing i wonder if part of our job is to help people think differently about the norm the concept of the norm the mental model that is the norm we all have a mental model of what it means to be norm normal yeah. normative i don't know what that is is that do people think of that as preferable no i'm not saying that people prefer to be in the norm but i do think People, they prefer to be above the norm, right? They compare themselves to the norm. But if they're above the norm by even just a little bit, they're, then they're kind of like, oh, I'm I'm fat and happy. They can be complacent. Or I'm not fat and happy or whatever. They can be complacent. They can be complacent. They don't need to challenge themselves. Yeah. Um, Which is kind of a, a, a motivation killer. It is. So I wonder if we should try to change worldwide the way people think about the norm and the way that they compare themselves to the norm, you know? It yeah, maybe don't. I don't know. It hasn't been a big part of my life. I've always compared myself to me because I just figured um, I probably wasn't going to fit in anyway. Oh, yeah, you came from a different... Yeah, so like I never really was part of the norm, never got to be part of the norm. Yeah. So never really thought of it. I, I, do, I don't think of the norm. I, I Like the norm doesn't have any yeah. real value or, or like. Meaning. Yeah. Influence. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of. Um, it's a non. Inert. Non-essential thing. Yeah. It's interesting because I was on the other end of it, as you know. Yeah. I was always above the norm in grades and in things. And I wasn't until I had actually. One actually, one particular professor uh, when I was in college, who, because you know, when you're told all the time that you're above the norm, you don't push harder than you think you need to push because you think you're already there. Yeah. And I wrote a, I remember I wrote a paper for him, and uh, it was a good paper. And I handed him my paper. He said, "Is this the best you can do?" Yeah. And I was, and I said, "Oh, maybe not." And I took the paper back. And then I rewrote it, worked on it some more. Same thing. I hand it to him. He says, is this the best you can do? 
I was like, oh, God, maybe it's not, you know, and I, you know, so you doubt yourself. I went back, I wrote it again, right? And I was writing a three-page paper on detokables democracy in America. It was not an easy wow. task, right? So I do the That's third great. time, and he asked me again, and I took it back one more time, and then I rewrote it. More fourth time. time. The fourth time I handed in, and he said, is this the best you can do? And I said, yes. And he wow. said, great. And I got an A minus on it. <laughs> I was so upset. <laughs> I thought it was an A minus. But that's the thing is there there was more in me. Yeah. But I didn't even question that because I had been taught my whole life that I was better than yeah, most. Whatever you turned in was good was enough. Work. Yeah. Right. And then but that was transformative for me. So I was like, oh, I can go above expectations. I can push because I want to be better for myself, not because yeah. I'm you know, and it totally changed the way I think about everything from that point on and my first jobs. And so I became that person that went an extra mile and yeah. you know, always. Like contrast that against my experience of mm -hmm. like, we. I think we were reading, I forget what grade it was, but we were reading like The Outsiders or something. Yeah, yeah. Some, which I liked the book and I read book. the book and I got a lot out of the book. But um, there was a book report due and I didn't have like the interest enough to write the book report. But mm -hmm. at the time I was building a, a Native American diorama, like the ones in the Natural History Museum yeah. with my nice father, one. like a really, really nice one, really elaborate. And it took like a couple months to build and I was in the process of building it. And and so I brought I turned that in. <laughs> You turned in a diorama yeah. to satisfy a, a book, book report, report. and the, the diorama outsiders. wasn't even about the book. No, <laughs> it's it was totally unrelated. And but it was cool. It was super cool, and it was what I was interested in. Yeah. And my teacher just didn't know how to make any sense of it, and gave me an F. Oh, see that's sad. But it's. I think the diorama was like a, like a plus. Well. Yeah, I mean, so that's part of the point, right? So why not have a system where you can demonstrate some understanding of the book in any medium you choose? Or not. Or not. Well, then you, you could just to. build a diorama. No, you're right. I don't know how to handle like, that. Like, why that book? I don't, I don't know. It seems pretty random that you just pick a book and make everybody read the same book. Why? That's true. Why not just have people read a book that they're interested in? There's a lot of books. Yeah. No. <laughs> like there's no shortage of books. Right. I so see. you could just pick a book that you're interested in. See, that would be more interesting. What if every person picked the book they want to read and then they told the whole class about it for four minutes? That'd be awesome. And it's like I read Then the class books. would have read 30, 30 books. books. That's a good idea. It's a great idea. You heard that here because that's a great idea. I know. But we have to normalize which book we read. That's wacky. That's silly. Right. So here's here's a classic example of the problem with the norm as a concept. I was told I was above. You were told you were below. That fundamentally... I wasn't even on the norm because there was no XY coordinate norm oh. for diorama building. <laughs> you were on a different page. <laughs> I was just a dot on a page. <laughs> You're the anomaly That was a there. random data point in space. Yeah, but think about it. There was no norm associated. So with, sad. Yeah, it's very sad. For little Derek. Yeah. For younger Derek. I thought it was a cool project, and I got to work with my dad. Which was amazing. Which was amazing. And I got to study something I cared about, which was the long homes of the Native Americans. And I got to build it and tactically like think about it at super micro and macro levels. And it was amazing. And we got to go to the Natural History Museum together and see some of the amazing dioramas before yeah. we started it. And then we tried to build a diorama that was like museum quality diorama, which I learned a ton of stuff about. And, you know, I just thought I'd share it with my teacher. Yeah. Seems like a cool thing to do. It is a cool thing to do, but here's where you butt up against the idea of the norm again. So it's normal. It's not normal. Here's what's normal. Everybody reads the same book and has to write a report on it. That's normal. That's AKA boring. Boring. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. This norm thing is, it's not good. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's not good. It's just, it's kind of, I mean, I don't want to curse, but it's, you know, it's effed up. It messes people up. Think about. Was that the curse you were going to use? I'm trying not to curse. I'm trying not to curse.
it's it's messed up. But here's the point. It set me on a trajectory where I didn't push myself as much as I could have. Yeah. It set you on a trajectory where you where you literally believed for a long part of your life that you were dumb, lazy, you wouldn't fit in. You know, it, it set up a bunch of mental models for you that became how you interacted with the world and the path that you took. Totally. Just like it did for me, just different paths, <laughs> right? Yeah. We should think about that. We should start some sort of a campaign to like stop the norm. Avoid the noid. Avoid. Remember avoid the noid in Domino's Pizza? He was like the little gremlin dude in the in the pizza that made it like cold or something. Avoid the noid. We could be avoid avoid the norm. <laughs> Storm the norm. Storm the <laughs> Ignore the norm. <laughs> <laughs> was the noid? The I don't remember the noid. The noid. He was like this, like little circus clown, like what jester. What did he do to the pizza? I think he would make it cold, because it was like when Domino's was offering thirty minutes or less, or it's free oh. or something, and the noid would be like this dastardly little guy that would like make the pizza cold or make it. I don't know. He would we do stuff to, to the out. pizza that wasn't cool. <laughs> There's so many possibilities. <laughs> yeah, and so. But what does he do to the pizza? He does bad things to the pizza. Why is he in a red pantsuit with ears? He's a court jester. <laughs> There's a picture of him with a pizza crusher here. Yeah. What's he crushed it. Oh, that's right. They had the they had the thing in the center. Oh, the little table thing. The table. The little plastic table thing. That would make it so the pizza wouldn't get crushed. That's... That was like an invention at some point. Now it's just kind of standard, but... Avoid the noid. Okay, so we need to come up with a slogan ignore about the, the norm. norm. Ignore the norm. Ignore the norm? I don't know if it's ignore the norm. I don't know. I'm not like fundamentally against the mathematical concept of norm. No, but that's what I'm saying. That's where it's useful is mathematically. Yeah, but but it's it's just like how much weight do we put in these norms and and where we sit in relation to them? That's the part that I worry about. Yeah. Is what how it affects how we think about I think ourselves. a better a better measurement is 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 our motto better every day. Yes. You know, we're be, better better at what? At the things you care about. Yeah. Better than who? Yourself. Better than yourself, you yes. know, and and like I love that. That's kind of the most important uh measure. Measure of success because you know, success really happens incrementally. That's right. You know, I think Einstein said something to the effect of like, I forget what he said about compound interest. He said it was like one of the most important ideas in all of the mathematics. And it's just this idea that this like little, these little incremental compounding effects, if we understood that, that not just as a financial concept, but as like a universal oh, concept, right. not just in finance, but as something that applies kind of universally to life, like micro makes the macro. The micro makes the macro. Paper cuts. Yeah, yeah, it's just like these little things add up. And if you can get better every day than you were the day before at whatever you care about, mm -hmm. whether it's diorama building or book reporting or de Tocqueville or you know whatever it is. Three pages on Tocqueville. Yeah, that's that hard. Um, but sure. whatever you care about, and do better than you did yesterday. And compare yourself to yourself. And compare yourself to that's, yourself. That's a recipe for happiness. Yeah. Because if you're always progressing on the things that you care about in relation to where you're at, and you're starting, you, that that means that the field you're on is always fair. Yeah. Right? Because it's you against you. Yeah. And I think everybody would do better that way. But they'd be they'd do way better. We'd have we'd yeah. have a we'd have a, a world full of superstars if everybody did that. Not just superstars. You yes. The norm would be superstardom. No. See, now you've ruined it. <laughs> I ruined it. No, it's not about that. It's not about kidding. superstars because superstars are still comparative. It's about self. No, I'm saying like people that are just like off the charts doing amazing things. For themselves. You know? Like for themselves. Yes. Well, not just for themselves. They and would be others. doing amazing things for others because yes. they would be so good at what they did because they were just focused on incrementally getting better than they were the day before at something they were passionate about, yes. something they cared about, and they'd be regardless happier. of whether anybody else cared about it. But they'd be happier. And they'd be happier. So they would serve the world. They would self-actualize. Better relationships because they'd, they'd yeah. be secure. Yeah. You would not have anxiety and insecurity. I think that's the way to build I think world. that's a winning concept. Better every day 
is something that we could all do and all get behind and it would be good for everybody and good for society. It would be. And I think, you know, a big part of like what we're doing with the the thinking quotient, the the assessment and the and then that that kind of establishes a baseline and then you got your your course, mm-hmm. the the credential course that kind of gives you the background. Yep. To sort of get better every day at the mental models that you're making mm-hmm. that drive whatever it is you're passionate about, you know? Yeah. That's kind of a that's the real point behind better every day. Um, yeah, and I think the nice thing about better every day is it in in a in a way in a sort of circuitous way through this conversation, it is the opposite of the norm, right? Yeah. It's, it it counteracts that tendency we have to be comparative with others. Now we're comparative with ourselves. Exactly. Right? Am I getting better at this or that? Yeah. How am I improving? Yeah. And that's a recipe for success. It's a recipe for happiness. It's a recipe for self-assuredness, reduces all those things that people are dealing with. And we're trying to get better every day ourselves. We're trying to get our podcast better every day. We are. Every episode. And um, we're super psyched that people are enjoying it mm-hmm. and watching it. Yes. Downloading it, liking it, commenting on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of those things help us out. Help us move this all forward. Help us move it forward. We're now in the 3% uh, Hard to of podcast worldwide. So we're move, moving up pretty quick mm-hmm. um, because of you all. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, share it with your friends. Share it with your everybody. loved ones. Share it with your colleagues. Your share enemies. it with everybody. Your enemies. <laughs> yeah, like people you don't know on the street. Just tell them about it. Just share it. Share it. Yeah. Because uh, that's going to help us be able to do cooler and cooler things. It's going to help us get better every day. Yeah. And that, I believe, is a wrap. Mm-hmm.